have a good day dear students so today we are going to start a new text which is um, a new chapter which is the mother of a traitor written by maxim gorky so this is uh, unit 1 and chapter 5 uh, in that particular section and we are going to start this particular in the paper which is the mother of a traitor it's a beautiful uh, short story but um, it has so much of conflicts and uh, so much of emotions uh, attached to it so we'll discuss all that but before that usually we have a regular practice because for those students who um, learn literature we know that it's all start from the author then slowly move to the to his writings or to the text right so we'll uh, start with this particular uh, chapter from uh, the author's perspective first let's introduce who the author is maxim gorky is the author of this particular story which is a mother of a traitor and he was born in the year 1868 and died in the year 1936 um maxim gorky is actually his pseudonym Now, his actual name, his full name, is Alexey Maximovich Peshkov. That's his actual name. So the Sura name for uh, Alexey Maximovich Peshkov is Maxim Gorky. Maxim Gorky is actually a Russian short story writer and also a novelist who first attracted attention with his naturalistic and his sympathetic uh, way of narrating stories. and especially because he uh, lived during the 19th and 20th century uh, most of his writings reflect the problems and the social issues of that particular time and most of his writings actually reflect the social outcast and he wrote stories relating to um, the relevant uh, issues which are uh, uh, especially the issues which is relating to the working class backgrounds as well because gorky himself was coming from a working class background so most of his short stories has uh, reflect the working class background with this perspective and also he wrote a number of novels and plays and one of the most famous play of maxim gorky is the lover death uh since rus uh, gorky is coming from a working class background um it is important to understand uh, his real struggles which he has gone through because that actually reflected in his writings as well because if you go through his writings he actually uh, especially in his real life he uh, worked in different fields like um, as a uh, assistant in a shoemaker shop uh, and also as an iconic painter and also as a dishwasher uh, on a volga steamer but this was the most important turning point because being working as a dishwasher on a volga steamer it actually uh, made him to or introduce him to the reading or introduce him to read books uh, because one of the cook in the volga steamer actually introduced him or helped him in reading and this act was actually a turning point in maxim gorky's life and he read uh, books which later becomes one of his main passion in his life but because he is from a working class background um the some of the most of we know that people who are from the working class background they were most of the uh, people especially during the uh, 1890s 20th century actually the people uh, the employees uh, usually treat very badly towards the um, their employees right so here uh, maxim gorky was also a victim to it and uh, he was frequently beaten by the employers and also uh, faced a uh, hunger and starvation in his real life so you know the pains and struggles of the social uh, of the working class people and also the people uh, uh, the especially the working class uh, people who, uh, who uh, are actually struggling so all this become uh, reflected in his writing as well 
if you look at his name, Maxim Gorky, Gorky is used here as a pseudonym uh, to show the bitterness of his early experiences. And this is a reason why he chose Gorky as the second name for or the surname for his uh, pseudonym. So, uh, because to uh, as a nostalgia or, or as a uh, the tortures and the struggles which he faced in his real life is actually carried on and reflected uh, through the name which is Gorky, which he chose as his surname. Uh, moving further into the text, because the text which we are referring to for this course is the mother of a traitor. Uh, it is important to understand the mother of a traitor is a story which uh, uh, is mainly a conflict between uh, the mother and the son in this particular context. Uh, the conflict uh, between ambition uh, uh, of, or a conflict between an ambitious son and uh, and a uh, savior mother we can uh, predict in that way because the text talks about a mother who really uh, is uh, who really feels the need for saving her city uh, instead of saving her son so that conflict between uh, within the mind of the mother is a main important or the underlying theme in this particular story um, uh, it's also a story of sacrifice. Uh, we can read in that perspective as well. Uh, and also the story of an ambitious son, as I mentioned, because he is the main uh, protagonist and also the villain in this particular story, because he is the one who, um, because the mother of a traitor. So from the title itself, it's very significant that who is a traitor. The son is a traitor and the mother of a traitor. So the main protagonist here. actually 
helped him to focus more on art and literature and this actually had immense power and influence uh, on his writings and uh, in literature he was later appointed the head of the soviet writers union and founded the school of social Revo soviet Revo realism uh, but uh, now we are going into the text uh, or the text what the text talks about it's actually a text which uh, is about like um, five six pages so uh, it's actually six pages so we'll read very fastly but we need to understand how this uh, informations are very much relevant because you when, when you read the text it actually helps you to understand more about the characters the um the, how the story is developing the story the plot the structure so in order to get all these details it is essential to uh, read the text one can talk endlessly about mothers for several weeks enemy host had surrendered the city in a tight ring of steel by night fires were lit and the flames peered through the inky blackness of the walls of the city like a myriad red eyes they blazed mail violently and a menacing glare evoked gloomy thoughts within the beleaguered city the first paragraph it actually talks about uh, the mother because one can talk endlessly about mothers right so do uh, you know that this is uh, like um, the uh, the enemy in the first paragraph it says some of the keywords let's see what all are the keywords one can talk endlessly about mothers then it talked about for several weeks enemy holes are surrounded in the city okay and another information is night fires were lit and flames so imagine that you know it's a city and uh, enemies are surrounded by uh, are surrounded by the city and at the night the flames are lit and uh, the walls of the city like a myriad red eyes like the eyes are you know red and dark because of the darkness so i hope that you can imagine that you know in dark and red eyes right so it's actually it reflects something bad or an ill omen or a devil why because a dark figure with the red eyes usually represents the darkness and the evil spirit right the blaze malevolence and the menacing glare evoked gloomy thoughts within the biblical city so you need to understand that the city was surrounded by this uh you know uh, red eyed uh you know the red eyed uh, uh, and the black spirited people especially they are the enemies and it is night because they were sitting uh with the flames and uh, the the fires are lit and what they were talking about they were talking about mother all of them have so much to say about their mothers so one can talk endlessly about mothers so that's where the first line itself it starts with this particular one can talk endlessly about mothers but the next line next sentence it actually tells us about it is about enemies surrounded uh, by the city and the city is on fire and uh, uh, the people living in the city they are uh, scared and they are uh numb and uh, something is happening outside which is very dangerous that's why the it looks like a dark spirit with a red eyed uh, eyes so so many people are there so this is what the image of this particular character in this part in the beginning of this particular story from the walls they saw enemy news draw tighter so the dark shadows hovering around about the fires and heard the name of well-fed forces the clanging of weapons 
the loud laughter and singing of man confident of victory and what can be more jarring to the ear than the songs and laughter of the enemy so second paragraph talked about the enemy more about the enemy the first paragraph we talked about the enemy but the second paragraph adding more uh, tightness to the description by saying that the enemies are drawing nearer and nearer right it was tighter and tighter like and also you can find that there are horses and the horses are well-fed horses and the enemies are laughing and are very happy and they have uh, you no know, weapons in their uh, in their hands and in their body and uh, all this danger it actually pronounces a uh, dangerous coming to the city right now let's see what is happening. The enemy had thrown corpses into all the streams that feed that fed water to the city. And they had burned down the vineyards around the walls, trampled the fields, cut down the orchards. The city was now exposed on all sides, and nearly every day the cannon and muskets of the enemy showered it with the lead and iron. So, again, the third paragraph again talked more in detail about the enemies, right? The first paragraph just gave us a brief idea about the enemies. Second paragraph, which actually adds more details to those enemies and the enemies are drawing nearer and nearer to the city. Now, they, this third paragraph it is about the violent action. Especially the violent action here means they are actually cut off in the bodies of those people who are trying to feed the villagers with water because people have to come out of their houses to carry or uh, uh, to feed, uh, to fetch water from the streams, right? So those, especially women and men, they were killed. And everywhere the houses are burned and the walls are uh, burning and the fields are completely damaged and uh, the gardens everything was cut down now you can find the uh, what sort of a danger we were talking about the city is burning actually the city uh, the people are dying uh, more uh, corpses uh, you know, lying everywhere on the roads and around the city. So, it's, and the most important one which you have to see is that it nearly every day, it's an every day uh, a scene or the visualization for the city uh, uh, or the villages or the people who lives in the city because every day some people die and the enemies try to attack them. So, it's actually an everyday happening detachments of so what will happen because due to fear you cannot move out of the house because your only shelter lies within your own uh, four walls of the house so the detachments are war weary half starved soldiers troop suddenly through the narrow streets of the city from the windows of houses issued the groans of the wounded the cries of the delirious the pray prayers of women and the wailing of children. People spoke in whispers, breaking off in the middle of a sentence. Tensely alert. Was not that the enemy advancing? The actual shows are more to it by saying that the enemy is advancing closer and closer to us. They are trying to attack each and every villages. They are just now moving within the city and even the people within, especially the city people, the villages or the city dwellers, they are actually trying to you know, uh, look up to the window uh, to see what's happening outside. And you can find that uh, people are crying within because of pain, because, of, because they are not getting treatment and people are crying. And uh, uh, and also starvation, and also uh, women are praying. So you can find how disturbed whole narration is. It's completely disturbed. 
Worst of all were the nights. In the nocturnal stillness of groans and cries were more distinctly audible. Black shadows crept stealthily from the gorges of the distant mountain towards the half demolished walls, hiding the enemy camp from view, and over the black ridges of the mountains rose the moon like a lost shield dented by sword blows. Again, the enemy camps, especially the, the narrator is saying night is more vulnerable than daytime because night you can see the black shadows are moving here and there and you can see them from a distant mountains and also they are hiding here and there and it rose the moon like a long shield dented by sword blows. So they carry swords and they move here and there. They look like a black shadow. And the people in the city, despairing of succor, worn out by toil and hunger, the hope of salvation waning from day to day. The people in the city stared in order at that moon and at the sharp to the ridges of the mountains, the black mass of the gorges, and the noisy camp of the enemy. Everything spoke to them of death, and not a star was there in the sky to give them consolation. This paragraph, it actually talks about the loss of hope. There's no hope for them. Whatever hope they had, they are now completely, uh, completely uh, out of uh, senses. They are not able to mm, keep uh, their hope or hold people of their hope. They are completely, uh, you know, completely tired because of hunger, starvation, and their only solace was the way end to it. But that also is no more with them. So they all are completely distressed and thinking that death is very near to them day by day the death is coming closer and closer to them so now even the moon the star the sky is not giving them any hope of salvation they are completely tired especially because of hunger because of detachment all this are happening in fever they were afraid to light the lamps in the houses and the heavy darkness enveloped the streets. And in this darkness, like a fish stirring in the depths of a river, a woman draped from head to foot in a black clock moved soundlessly. So now, what is a figure? All this while, the previous paragraph, we talked about a group of people, which are, which are the enemies. They are coming closer and closer. But... In this particular paragraph, you can find one woman, out of all the enemies, one woman is completely clocked, but she is one who moves fearlessly uh, between the enemies. So the question is, who is she? Uh, what is her name? And why is she here? And why she is fearless? Is she, uh, you know? Someone belong to the enemy group or to the city, city dwellers? Who is she and why is she fearless? So, so many questions that comes to our mind when we come to know that, you know, one woman figure, you know, completely draped from head to foot in a black cloth and she is moving fearlessly and soundlessly. When they saw her, people whispered to one another. Is it she? Is it she? And they withdrew into the niches under archways or hurried past her with the lower heads. The patrol chiefs warned her sternly. So someone stopped her while she was moving soundlessly. But someone stopped her. So this actually gives us the information that she is not from the enemy group. She is one among the city, city dwellers. Abroad again, Mona Mariana. So now we realize who she is. The name is Munna Mariana. So she is Munna Mariana. 
take care, you may be killed and nobody will bother to search for the culprit. So someone is warning her. And who is that? It's actually the patrol chief. So the patrol chief is saying, mm -hmm. Mona Mariana, please be careful. You will be killed by these enemies. And be careful if you are killed. No one is going to find out who the killer is. So be very careful. She threw herself up and stood waiting. But the patrols passed by, either not daring or else scorning to raise a hand against her. The armed men avoided her like a corpse and left alone in the darkness. She continued her solitary wanderings from street to street, soundless and black like the incarnation of the city's misfortune, while all about her as though pursuing her. Melancholy sounds issued from the night, the groans, cries, prayers, and the sullen murmurs of soldiers who had lost all hope of victory. So it is important to understand that this woman is the only one woman who is walking very carelessly, I mean like very soundlessly and fearlessly. She is moving from street to street. The patrol chief warned him. He did not stop her, but he just warned her, be very careful. But he also left her uh, because, um, you know, they realized that. I mean, there's nothing more to say. It is up to her whether to, what to choose and uh, uh, what to do. So they completely left her. She's moving uh, again from street to street. So everywhere you can find, you know, the groans, the cries, the prayers and the sullen murmurs of soldiers who had lost all hope of victory. So you can find the, uh, the patrol chiefs and the soldiers who are trying to protect the city. They are losing all hope. They are completely uh, perished and vanished. Uh, in this particular situation, they don't have any hope at all whether they will live or die or whether they will be able to protect the city or not mm -hmm. because the enemy group is or the enemy troops are growing nearer and nearer to the city, almost nearer, nearer to the city. So in such a situation, uh, the enemy troops, they, I'm sorry, the patrol chief and the soldiers and those come all hope about the current situation. A citizen and a mother, she thought of her son and her country. So suddenly you can find from this paragraph onwards, suddenly the mood of the story and the narration is completely changed. Because all this while we were uh, discussed about the, you know, the city, the enemy groups, the petrol chiefs, and how the struggles and the traumas of the city dwellers. So these were the discussions. But suddenly you can find uh, uh, a completely different narration from all this, like a citizen and a mother. She thought of her son and her country, for at the head of the men who were destroying her town was her son. So completely different because suddenly, because the question was, who is this woman? We got to answer her name is Mona Mariana. And if she is Mona Mariana, then why is she roaming here fearlessly? So now we are getting the answer to this question in this particular paragraph that she is a citizen of the city and also a mother. And she thought of her son and her country for at the head of the men who were destroying her town was her son. So now you will get to know what the significance of this particular title because the mother of a traitor. So who is this traitor? What is the relation of Munna Mariana with the you know enemy group? And why is she moving fearlessly here? Because it is her son who is attacking the city which she belongs to. So the question is, why is he attacking the city which belongs to him? Because if he is also if if he is the son of this mother, then he also belongs to the city. So why is he attacking? His city and uh, whether he will kill he kill uh, his own mother or not so these questions and conflicts will be there in our mind as a reader but we get to know more about the sun right
So a citizen and a mother, she thought of her son and her country. For at the head of the men who were destroying her town was her son, her gay, handsome, heartless son. Yet, not so long ago, she had looked upon him with a pride regarding him as her precious gift to her country, a beneficent force she had brought forth to aid the people of the city where she herself had been born and reared. Her heart was bound by hundreds of invisible threads to these ancient stones with which her forefathers had built their homes and raised the walls of the city to the soil wherein lay buried the bonds of a king's folk, to the legends, the songs, and the hopes of the people. And now this heart had lost a loved one, and it wept. She weighed in her heart as on scales her love for her son and her love for her native city, and she could not tell which weighed the more. So, this actually shows that she is moving to the city, but she has a purpose and she is very much related to the city because she was born and brought up in the city and she is very much familiar with the, um, uh, with the city, the surroundings and everything. So that's the reason why it is mentioned here. Her heart, her, her, sorry, her heart was bound by hundreds of invisible threads to these ancient stones with which her forefathers had built their homes and raised the walls of the city, to the soil wherein lay buried the bonds of her king's folk, to the legends, the songs, and the hopes of the people. And now this heart had lost a loud one and it so now someone is lost and it is crying. She weighed in her heart as on scales her love for her son, her love for her native city. So on one side she, is, she loves her son so much and on the other she loves the city as much as her son and she could not tell which weighed the more. So it's a very conflicting situation because she is very difficult to choose one out of these two because either the sun or the city. So she is actually in a very conflicting situation in this particular city. So for the time being, we'll stop here and we have further more. Uh, so we'll go with that in the next session of this, the part two of this particular session.